very much indeed for inviting me to come and give a lecture on why we need to cheer up and why the world is, is getting better. I hope um, when you leave this evening, you leave enthused, um, and believing that, that actually progress is, is happening and it's happening all around us. Um, I'm a big fan of the Freedom Association. I think that what you stand for, and I, I admire what you stand for, and I hugely admire uh, Simon. Um, Simon Richards, your CEO, and the Freedom Association, I regard as great bastions of liberty, of the case for freedom. You've been making the case for freedom not just for a few years. I think I'm right in saying the Freedom Association has been making the case for freedom for decades. And um, you may have noticed we're in the middle of a, an election campaign at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's fair to say that this election campaign perhaps shows more than any other reason why it is we need to make the case for freedom. Irrespective of who any of us would like to win, and I, I'm guessing that maybe some people here lean one way rather than, than the other, but irrespective of, of who you want to win this election, it's pretty clear to me that there is no party in this election contest that is unambiguously on the side of freedom. We have a, a Labour Party that wants to reintroduce rent controls and wants to nationalise broadband. We have, well, goodness knows what the Liberal Democrats have in their manifesto. I must confess I've not yet got around to, to, to reading it. Um, I, 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 I think I, I, I don't need to read it to decide that they're not an option for me. But even the Conservatives, who should know better, have spent the past decade in power introducing more nanny state measures. Now, I, I hope with Boris Johnson that we see a profound sea change in this approach. But many of the more invidious nanny state measures that have happened, sugar limits in Coke, um, all sorts of nanny state measures. They've been introduced, they've been written onto the statute book in, in blue ink. Um, now, at a gathering like this, when you get a meeting of the, the free market tribe, the, the classical liberals, it's very easy for us to become all purist and to start to be a little downbeat, to, to suddenly sort of start thinking that we alone are pure libertarians and politicians don't quite come up to our our mark. And we become all downbeat and morose and depressed. And, and to be honest, look at the state of our politics. It's pretty easy if you look at the state of our politics over the past couple of years to be pretty downbeat. You've had petty, petulant politics. In fact, not just the past couple of years, I would say over the past couple of decades. You've had a series of mediocrities holding office, yeah. doing what Sir Humphrey says, with no principle. <laughs> Added to that, it's late November, <coughs> it's dark, it's damp, and it's raining. So it's pretty easy, if you want to be, to be pessimistic. But my message is, cheer up. The world uh, is getting better, and the world is getting better because freedom is advancing. It's advancing despite not because of politicians. And I, I want, to, I want to, to really make it clear, so that I hope it's beyond a dispute, that the world is getting better. Now, news is often dominated by, by bad news. Terror attacks, wars in the Middle East, migration crises, oceans turned to acid and polluted by plastic, catastrophic changes to the climate, gender inequality. This is what we read about in newspapers. We seem to be bombarded by bad news. Television is packed full of pessimism, and I don't just mean Jon Snow on Channel 4. <laughs> <laughs> Newspapers report with relish all kinds of calamity. Our Twitter timelines swarm with indignation about the latest outrage. To be aware of the news is often to feel mildly depressed. But hang on a second, in recent decades we've been warned about all sorts of looming calamities. In the 1970s, oil was apparently going to run out and then there was going to be a new ice age, apparently, on its way. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened to that. Then in the 1980s, there was acid rain and nuclear war that were going to wipe us out. After that, we were told there was overpopulation, epidemics, famine, rising sea levels. Today, it's global warming that's apparently going to get us if an asteroid impact or Brexit doesn't get us first. But despite all of these project fear, you might call them, scenarios that we've been fed by the intellectual elites and the media classes, the world's actually not got worse at all. In fact, it's been getting better, steadily better. 
For most people, there's never been a more comfortable time to be alive than there is today. Now, that's not to say there aren't all sorts of instances of individual suffering for refugees in Burma and Syria and goodness knows for people living in London today and, and Los Angeles. But for most of us in most countries on the planet, life today is better by almost every conceivable measure. We're living longer, healthier, and I would also say happier lives than before. Now, some facts. Life expectancy in America in 1950 was 68. Today, it's nearly 80. I'm sure you know that here in the UK, when you reach your 100th birthday, you get a telegram from the Queen. Now, when the Queen first ascended the throne in 1952, apparently she sent out only a handful of these, and there were so few that she sent out she could do it personally from her. Now, there are something like 8,000 messages that need to be written every year. Um, apparently, they've had to sort of automate the process because there are so many people getting a, a message from the Queen to celebrate their 100th birthday. And worldwide, life expectancy in, in 1960 was 52, today it's 71. That's, that's a pretty dramatic increase in longevity. Infant mortality is down. In, in 1960, I find this an extraordinary statistic. In 1960, out of every thousand babies born, 132 of them, sorry, 113 of them, wouldn't make it to their first birthday. Today, it's only 32 and it's fallen fast. Yeah, killer diseases are in retreat, deaths from malaria, from HIV. You know, in Uganda, where I grew up in the 1970s and 80s, life expectancy was 40-something. The country was so chaotic, no one could actually work out what the life expectancy was, but it was estimated to be 40-something and falling. Today in Uganda, it's 60-something and rising, and rising so rapidly, it's expected to catch up with us in the not-too-distant future. You know, stroke deaths in America have halved since 1990. In South Korea, they've fallen by two-thirds. I mean, one of my favourite statistics is road traffic deaths in the UK have fallen from almost 8,000 in 1965 to fewer than 2,000 today, and that's despite the fact there's been this massive increase in the number of cars on the roads. We're not just living longer, but we're much better off too. In, in Britain, we're twice as rich as our grandparents and a third better off than we were even 30 years ago. Um, Average income in the UK today is 119% higher than it was in 1950. If you think back to 1990, I don't know what you were doing in 1990. I just started university in 1990. We're a third better off on average than we were in 1990. We're paid much higher real wages while working fewer hours. Now, in this election, we've heard certain politicians say they're going to introduce a four-day week. Um, I, I think it'd be a disaster if they mandated there was a four-day week. But I suspect that in future, if you want to only work four days, you'll be able to work four days. The weekend itself, the whole notion of a five-day week is a relatively modern invention mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. incomes mm -hmm. are, are going up. <coughs> now, people at this point usually say, but what about people in poor countries? It's all right for the rich in rich countries. They've grown richer. But what about poor people in poor countries? Actually, poorer countries have grown richer even faster. Now, there are a handful of exceptions, Afghanistan, Somalia, Syria, but almost every country today is better off than it was in the 20th century, and for me, the absolute standout example of this is, is China. In 1950, the average person living in China wasn't simply poor. They were poor, as poor as their ancestors would have been 2,000 years before. The average income of someone in China in 1950 hadn't really increased compared to someone living in China in AD 50, almost 2,000 years before. Since 1950, output per capita in China has increased by almost 9,000%. Uh, you know, a country that was stuck in rice fields now has iPads. In the past decade alone, Chinese GDP per capita has risen fivefold. That's a larger leap in 10 years in China than at any time between the birth of Jesus and the death of Chairman Mao. It's quite phenomenal what's happening out there. Now, for the first time in human history, the share of the world's population living in extreme poverty, that's defined as less than um, basically $2 a day, it's now less than 10%, and it's falling. But the price of food globally has fallen by 22% since 1960. Workers worldwide have 17% more free time than they did in 1950. And child labour, something we're much more aware of now, child labour has actually halved since 1990, perhaps precisely because we're aware of it. 
You don't need to look far afield to other countries. Just think of your own life. In the 1970s, air travel was so expensive that in the tabloid press, when they talked about people who flew regularly, they talked about them being in the jet set. Well, you can go online and join the jet set by EasyJet for 30, 40 quid if you book online. In the 1970s, international phone calls were so expensive that if you had a relative in Australia at Christmas time, you would book a call several weeks in advance so you could speak to them for an absolute fortune on a crackly line. My 11-year-old, 10-year-old, um, babbles the way to her cousins in Melbourne on, on one of these, and it, I think it's virtually free. The idea that you would have to wait for it seems ridiculous, absurd. Now, my argument's not just that the world's getting better in terms of prosperity and technology. It's, it's also more peaceful. It's not actually my argument at all. Stephen Pinker's made this point rather beautifully, and I won't labour it too much, but there are fewer wars being waged now than before. The chances of being killed in a conflict around the world are, are much lower. There are one or two exceptions to that, like Syria. But even in countries like the UK, where we like to be pessimistic sometimes, actually homicide rates have fallen dramatically in most Western countries since the 1990s. People still don't actually fundamentally understand why this is, but it's a fact. Now, my argument is that this improvement in the human condition has come about fundamentally because of the spread of liberty. I'm not, I'm not talking about narrow political freedom. I'm not saying this is because of democracy. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not arguing that we're richer and better off because of the spread of democracy. To be sure, democracy has spread. In 1950, only a handful of countries around the world were proper democracies, and almost all of those were, were English-speaking. By 1990, there were over 50 democracies. Today, over half the world's countries are now democracies. I'm not suggesting that improved material prosperity necessarily means you have to be a democracy. Clearly, China is materially far better off now than she was 20 years ago. But I think you'd be rather bold to argue that China is more democratic. In fact, in many ways, she, she may be less so now than she was then. And I think it's an awkward fact for those who say it's all about democracy when you look at countries that have enjoyed some of the fastest growth over the past 20 years, like China, like Turkey, like Ethiopia. If anything, some of them are actually more autocratic than they were in the 1990s. Now, when I say that there's more liberty and that it's liberty that's driving prosperity, I mean something much more elemental than political democracy. By liberty, I'm talking about the freedom to specialise as an individual in something and to exchange, to work and to retain the fruits of your labour and to exchange the proceeds of your labour with the fruits of somebody else's labour, to buy and to sell from an ever more complex web, from a, a, a web that may have started with the mud hut on your previously collectivised farm and which today means you can shop online on platforms that have sprung up around the world. Now, we take this for granted, but being able to specialise in exchange like that, having that liberty is a very rare, and in most parts of the world, very recent phenomenon. And it's so rare and so recent, I think it, it, it requires a little bit of examination. Because it's this freedom, one that we take for granted, that I think is the engine of human progress, the engine of all human progress. On the back of it, everything from technological process to iPhones to democracy to elections, all of, all of those things rest on the back of it. It has, in the words of, of Ronald Reagan, lifted our species from the swamp to the stars. It's just taken quite a long time. And I'm going to, I don't want to present you with an economics lecture. So I'm going to explain what I mean by specialization and exchange and as a driver of human progress with the aid of two props. Um, can anyone tell me what, what they think this might be? An axe head. An axe head? I, I said this to a group of six formers, and one of them went, a rock. Yep. It's, yeah. exactly. it's not quite an axe head. It's, it's, it's actually called a hand axe. It's even more primitive than an axe head. Early homo sapiens hadn't quite worked out how to put one of these on a piece of wood for a shaft, so it was a hand axe. You, you held it in your hand. And it was... I found this in Essex. It's at least 100,000 years old, maybe two, 300,000 years old. It was probably made by a, 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 a proto-human... Uh, where, where Clacton now stands, or close to where Clacton now stands. Clacton was the cutting edge technology of its day, still is. Um, and um, when I found it, I did something very 21st century. I got my iPhone and I took a photo of it. And then a thought struck me. Hang on, 
Here I was holding two objects built to be held by hand, handheld tools, separated by a few inches, but also by several hundred thousand years of, of human progress. And then a thought struck me that explaining how we got from one to the other is surely the essence of, of the story of, of human progress. They're, they're applauding this thought next to <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, I could make some glib comparisons. I could say they're both handheld objects, they're both the cutting edge technology of the day, they're both multi tools, you can do multiple things with this. You can, I'm told, do multiple things with a, with a hand axe if you're a hungry, hungry caveman or whatever it is. But actually, it's the differences that I think are worth just examining a little bit. This is made from a single material flint. This, on the other hand, has components in it that are very, very complex. It's got silicon, it's got aluminium, it's got compounds that the name of which I can't even pronounce. <laughs> Lithium, and, and that too, and that too. This was made probably locally. It may have been actually made where I found it, if not a few miles away. This, on the other hand, isn't just the product of one country. It's designed in California using chips from Japan, assembled in China, using software from India. It, it's got a supply chain that straddles the, the, the globe. To make one of these, one person has enough know-how to do it. I'm told that if you spend a, a, an afternoon with a couple of bits of rock, you could produce something pretty similar like that, maybe plus or minus a couple of fingernails. This, on the other hand, there is no one person alive, not even the late, great Steve Jobs, knows enough to make one of these from scratch. Even the engineers at Apple are simply assembling the know-how and the components designed by, by others. In other words, this represents a world of almost total self-sufficiency. You and your little band of early Essex men in Clacton, this is long before Essex even existed, <coughs> can create what you need, and you live as a result in a world of squalor, hardship, and literal dirt poverty. Well, our species can produce this through interdependence, through leveraging the know-how of others, people we've never met on the other side of the planet. Total inter interdependence. Our brains may be hardwired to see the world as safe and secure if we are self-sufficient. Actually, our prosperity comes from the opposite from being interdependent, from depending on others to supply us with everything from smartphones to coffee to, to fresh vegetables. Now, the default condition was, was this world of ab ab abject poverty. It's specialization and exchange, what we might crudely call trade, that's made us, made us rich. Now, when I say the world is better because of more liberty, it's because there's been greater freedom to specialize and exchange. Spontaneous order, freedom from top-down design, the freedom that you need to get from this world to that world. Now it's that that's got us from Flintstones to, to, to smartphones. The freedom to exchange. Now, why, why has it taken us so long? Why did it take us so long to get from, from this world to that world? You know, people were making Flintstones um, for hundreds of thousands of years. We're used to the idea that every year we get a new type of iPhone. Perhaps this year you're tempted to trade in your iPhone 5 for the iPhone X or whatever it is. We're used to the idea of change and innovation. Actually, for most of human's history, what we made was remarkably consistent. Um, small bands of hunter-gatherers, you know, certainly with the invention of farming that allowed the creation of towns and villages, there would have been some acceleration in innovation. But um, you know, we see the emergence of writing. But isolation, I would argue, inhibited innovation and, 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 and growth. But even after the creation of, of farming, and towns and, and villages. Innovation was still pretty, pretty slow by our standards. Most people who had ever lived before the 17th century would have noticed absolutely no discernible improvement in their material condition over the course of their lives. In fact, they would have lived and died, lived toiling away laboriously using the same type of tools that their great-great-grandparents would have used. It's almost as if we today were using the tools and the standard of living that are our, our, our early modern ancestors had had, if people had, you know, people at the time of the Battle of Hastings had had. But I would say it's not purely isolation that explains why there was stagnation and, and poverty um, in the human condition. People long had the ability to specialise in exchange and to move from a world of isolation and poverty to interdependence and wealth. But we don't see this, and we don't see this because that human capability for innovation was inhibited by other people. Now, when farming came along, 
People basically discovered that they could earn a living by growing crops. They grow a few crops. Then someone else discovered pretty quickly they could earn a living by nicking what the farmer had grown. And then someone else discovered that rather than coming and plundering what the farmer had grown, you could call yourself the government and you could tax it. And this is what happens. With, with the advent of farming comes the first city-states, and hierarchical extractive elites emerge at the top of those societies, and they extort from a mass of toiling farmers. And this is the human condition pretty much for, for about 10,000 years. If you, if you look at the river valleys, the centres of great civilizations, of the Yangtze or the Nile or the Euphrates or the Tigris, even Mexico Valley, you see for thousands of years these patriarchal societies with a small extractive elite at the top of them, very little change, um, and you know, someone living in, 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 in the Upper Nile or the Lower Nile in, in you know, the 19th century would have had about the same standard of living as someone living there pretty much at any previous point of the previous 3,000 years. Now, I, I, I use the term loosely, but this is, this is what you might call loosely feudalism. It's not strictly feudalism as understood by medieval European historians, but let's call it feudalism for short. And this feudal society is remarkably consistent and persistent, from India to Japan to Europe in the Middle Ages. It's, it's the norm that you are extorted by a small elite. In a feudal society, spontaneous economic order is impossible. It's a command economy. It's an economy based on the production of tariffs and tithes and, and tolls. There is no spontaneous economic order, not the kind that you need to produce innovation. Now, one of the best books I think written over the past few years is a book called Why Nations Fail by Ackermoggle and Robinson. And they talk about this. They talk about how societies have been historically rigged by small elites through, they would argue, institutions to keep people poor. Now, freedom to specialise and exchange is incredibly rare, and it's almost non-existent until this miracle, and I think we should call it the miracle. The miracle happens in Northwestern Europe. I would argue it starts first, not in England, I would say. I, I would say it actually happens first in the Dutch Republic. I'd say we're the second country around the world to have an industrial revolution, but it's a, it's a moot point. But the English and the Dutch start in the 18th century. America, Europe, and, and Japan follow in the 19th. In the mid-20th century, you see four small micro-Asian states, Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, then following. And then, in the late 20th century, some of the big macro-Asian giants follow. China, India, now Indonesia. And now, today, you're starting to see the same phenomenon happening even in Africa. Now, the orthodox explanation is that this miracle that, that, that freed us and elevated the human condition started because of the Enlightenment. This, uh, this Enlightenment, the change in the way that people thought in Northwestern Europe, uh, rippled out the effect of it, and it, it, it was a prelude to our takeoff. And there's, there's, some, there's some, some truth in this, but I would just say that you know, there's no shortage of, of clever people on hand to explain why what it is that clever people think influences the human condition. I think we should be a little bit sceptical of those who say it's all to do with Enlightenment intellectuals. But there is something in this. Certainly the, the, the Enlightenment sees major scientific advances, which are essential for our elevation. People start to explain the world rationally, rather than through voodoo and magic, but through reason. Fairy tale and tradition cease to be uh, enough of an explanation. And you know, reason then under, undermines the, the established authority of the old order, and we start to see the effect on the authority of, of kings and priests, those who owe their authority to a, a pre-Enlightenment um, source of legitimacy. Before, before the 18th century, before the Enlightenment, it was certainly assumed that you know, all that could be known was known. It was there in various religious texts, and you didn't need to look any further. The Enlightenment, as David Deutsch, the philosopher and physicist at Oxford, has said, was a, a rebellion against, um, against this. It was a rebellion against what he calls the authority of knowledge. Um, and I think it's important that the key to appreciating the threats of liberty today key to understanding where the threats of liberty and freedom come to today, is to understand that actually, much as though the Enlightenment played a part in the advance of freedom and prosperity, it didn't necessarily mean the spread of liberty. Actually, the Enlightenment all too often meant the very opposite. It meant the very opposite of, of freedom and liberty. If the Enlightenment was about reason, it also spawned what I term in my book, Progress versus Parasite, something called uber-rationalism. And uber-rationalism, I think, undoubtedly leads to epic episodes of, 
epic barbarism. The, the old orders, the kings and the emperors and the czars that govern Europe crumble, their authority crumbles. Those that draw their authority from pre-enlightenment sources lose power. But look at what the Enlightenment creeds and the creeds that the Enlightenment spawns put in their place. Hardly liberalism and democracy and freedom. The Jacobins in France unleashed this terror across Europe and then an extraordinarily bloody war across um, all the way to <coughs> Moscow. It's um, the tyranny of, of, of uber reason. They do it in the name of reason. The communists and the fascists then kill millions. Uh, scientifically modern states like Germany and Japan who are supposedly based on reason, engage in the most extraordinary barbarism in the name of, of reason, in the name of a perverted rationalism and a, a bogus, what I call, scienceism, and it leads to these extraordinary atrocities, a loss of liberty and lives of millions. I think it's important to understand this because the threat to freedom today is much more subtle than any of that. But it comes again from those who invoke reason and a bogus scienceism in order to try to impose a blueprint on the rest of us. It's a softer sort of uber-rationalism than the old uber-rationalism. There isn't a, a, a vanguard of the proletariat, but it's nonetheless insisting that they know what's best for the rest of society. It's brought to us by those who insist that they know enough about climate models, who know enough about what is a correct diet, who know enough about the economy and the society of 500 million Europeans to be able to presume to order us from above according to what they believe to be rational reason. Now the threat to liberty today comes, I think, from a, a fundamental conceit, and it's an uber-rationalism in the minds of an uber-educated class. They've got PPE degrees and MBAs coming out of their ears. But instead of the modesty that the Enlightenment should imbue them with, realising that there is no authority to knowledge. They claim to have an authority to knowledge. The central bankers claim it when they claim to know how to manage the economy of a country of millions. Government regulators claim to know it when they claim to know what's best for the rest. And it leads to this new priesthood of experts, experts who produce monetary policy and social policy and economics, based on what I would argue is a, a bogus empiricism. We see it in the claims of treasury officials who suggest that they can model precisely what GDP output is going to be in 10 years' time. They can't even get their budgets right on a quarter-by-quarter quarter basis for next year. We see it in environmentalists who claim that they're able to tell us what the sea levels are going to be in 50 years' time. There's an arrogance about this. They assume that they know enough. They assume that they can know enough. And they mistakenly regard what I would argue are, are non-linear systems as being linear. And then they're endlessly surprised when their forecasts are proved wrong. It's extraordinary. This is the threat to freedom today. It's bogus experts in charge of public policy who invoke a bogus empiricism that wards anyone away from questioning their authority. And we've had years of it in this country. It's crept up on us so slowly. But look at what it's done. These people, they tanked the banks. The more power they got to regulate the financial services, the greater the crisis they presided over, and the worse things became. They assumed that low interest rates could make us wealthy, and look at what that led to. They assumed it's okay to put flammable material to insulate tower blocks. Look at what happened to that. They assumed that it's okay to be open to large-scale immigration because there'll be no cultural implications because they foolishly believe in cultural relativism and that all cultures are the same. And look at the problems that that is creating. But the fundamental threat to, to freedom, I would argue, also comes from, from pessimism. Because this elite, these technocrats, these bogus empiricists, those who want to busybody and organise our lives for us, they need to have a sense of pessimism as a pretext to order our lives from on high. If you believe that self-order and spontaneous order is driving human progress, you don't need to trust an expert to put it right for you. But if you believe that things aren't working, you either believe you need a nudge, there's a nudge unit in Downing Street to patronise us at our expense, or worse, you think that things are so bad you need a master plan, a blueprint. Pessimism is what 
the elite have always needed in order to be able to try to take away our freedoms. The Jacobins. The Jacobins, I would say, the first horrific modern experience of trying to order up society by design. They, they even, I think at one time, had a year zero. They even tried to change the, 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 the number of months in a year to 10 months of the year. They were profoundly influenced by Rousseau, by Rousseau's idea that we had fallen from a pristine past. The idea that said that actually this world was better and more noble and more fulfilling than this world. It's nonsense. It's nonsense, the idea that the past was better. But they need this sense of pessimism, the sense that we've declined in order to justify remaking society. The communists, the communists saw history as a history of class war, of class struggle. And they argued that it needed the dictation of the proletariat to ensure that the potential of society could be fully realized. Today, you have socialists who argue that capitalism is broken. They tweet this on mobile phones produced by big corporations after a profit. They do this in Starbucks cafes produced by people who aren't supplying them with coffee for the love of it. They have no appreciation of, of capitalism, and yet they attack it in order to create this idea that there's a crisis, and they somehow magically must be given more power because they have the answer. Those who are anti-freedom today are pessimistic. They're pessimistic about the economy. They're pessimistic about the society. They're pessimistic about the environment. It's their latest way of, of, of justifying big government, is to, be, uh, to claim that we're heading towards an environmental disaster. They need pessimism to justify their intervention. This is why I urge you to be optimistic, not only because optimism is justified, optimism is true, there is a good reason to be optimistic. Tomorrow will be better than today. Well, I hope December the 13th will be better than today, but make sure you vote the right way to make sure that it is better than today. But they need, we need optimism, because it is the best way of guaranteeing that spontaneous order main, is maintained. We need to cheer up. We need to celebrate that a world of self-order, of individuals going about their own business, pursuing their own interests, doing their own thing, is what makes the world better. And if we proclaim that loudly enough, if we cheer up, if we're optimistic enough, it also puts the busybodies and the interventionists and the Corbynistas and the Eurofederalists and the socialists and all the other ists who want to order our lives, it puts them all out of business. Thank you.